Up next, Douglas Weaver is joined by Dr. Aaron Bagish, Associate Director of the Cardiovascular Performance Program at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. They discuss early repolarization in athletes. You've been studying athletes. Tell the audience a little bit about the database that you have and what you've been doing. I think it's important to start with some historical overview. Ever since we've had 12 lead ECGs and applied those to healthy, fit people, it's been quite clear that a significant minority, maybe even a majority, have a benign variant that is characterized by J-point elevation and ST segment elevation following that. And this has been regarded for many years as something that has no clinical relevance, that is just something we see. And it's been termed early repolarization. Early repolarization changed in 2009 with a seminal New England Journal paper by a Finnish group, Yanni Tikkanen and Michelle Hasegera, and they actually showed in the Finns that early repolarization carries an increased risk of mortality. Okay, this was a shock to many of us. And there are a couple of important points that set the stage for our discussion in athletes. One is that they changed the definition of early repolarization. No longer is early repolarization considered discrete J-point elevation, ST-segment elevation. It now includes terminal QRS notching or slurring, so a widening of the QRS. And so the thing that they describe as early repol, the phenomenon, is not what we've been seeing in athletes for decades and realizing is benign. So the definition has changed. The second thing is that the time point at which the mortality signal starts to appear is really in the fourth and fifth decade of life. Even when these individuals were studied with ECG in their teens and 20s, there wasn't any separation in mortality curves until they started to age. So this raises a number of questions about the relevance in the athletic population, particularly the young athletic population. That's where our work has been focused since. Right. And so you're saying the signal is occurring when people are developing coronary disease. I think that's right. Yeah. Now tell us about the database that you have and how you've been looking at early repolarization. So since 2004, we've maintained a database at Harvard University with all incoming student athletes, and we call this the Harvard Athlete Initiative. And essentially, every year the incoming freshmen are studied with ECG echo blood samples, and we follow them through the course of their college career and now out into young adulthood. And it sets up an opportunity to ask questions about specific things say, for example, early repolarization, and that's one of the things we did recently. What did you find? Well, we found using the new Tekin and Hasegera definition of early repol that we still see this pattern with QRS notching or slurring, ST segment elevation, and about a quarter of our athletes. And that when we asked the question, which type of athletes did we see it in, it was much more common in those of African-American descent. It was more common in those that had the most profound bradycardia, and it seemed to track with LVH voltage on the ECG. Now, the, all those other things you mentioned are common in athletes. That's right. That actually steps nicely into the next finding we had, and that is that the prevalence of early repull went up quite dramatically after a single season of training. So this is a dynamic pattern, and the prevalence seems to have something to do with how fit an athlete is. The fitter you are, the slower your heart rate, the higher your ECG volts, the more likely you are to see this. And where are we in understanding outcomes in these people? We still have some work to do. Admittedly, our athlete database and other athlete studies that have been published are much shorter than what have come from the general population studies done in Finland, China, and most recently Asia. And so we need to continue to follow athletes to understand this. However, I think it's important to say that there has not been a single observation of a death associated with isolated early repolarization in an athlete, to my knowledge, anywhere. So it does not seem to be a mortality signal in young, healthy people. A few years ago, I was involved with one of the orthopods who was screening the Detroit Red Wings, and I couldn't believe some of the abnormalities I saw on some of these ECGs. What are the ones that concern you? There's still a debate about what constitutes the normal ECG in the athlete, but there are a few patterns that must be considered pathology until proven otherwise. The first, which is uncommon but is very important, is a left bundle branch block. I'm not aware of any adaptive remodeling phenomenon that causes a left bundle branch block. So when that's present, that really necessitates further workup. The other thing, and this is a little bit more controversial, are the pattern location of T-wave inversions. T-wave inversions are common in athletes, particularly African-American athletes in the early precordial leads. But when they extend out into the apical leads, so V5, V6, and the lateral and limb leads, then certainly that needs to be considered structural heart disease until proven otherwise. So left bundle and non-anterior T-wave inversions, I think, are the two most common reasons for justified concern. And what about heart block? You see that on the ECGs as well. Heart block. Whenever we have an athletic patient in the hospital, we get the call at midnight from the nurses that there's second-degree heart block when the patient's asleep. First-degree heart block, type 1 second-degree heart block, very common and not pathologic. When you start seeing advanced second-degree heart block and third-degree heart block, that is not typically an adaptive phenomenon, so that's reason for concern about true conduction system disease. 
Excellent. What are your feelings about screening athletes and what athletes should be screened? It's a complicated topic, and to provide a short answer, I'll say that I very much support the current ACC AHA recommendations, which suggest that a history and physical is better than doing no screening at all. My personal belief, and I think we've published some data to support this, would be that in certain populations where the resources are available, that an electrocardiogram contributes to better accuracy within the screening process. But when we're talking about a one-size-fits-all common denominator, I think history and physical is all that's really feasible at this point. Yeah, it's very difficult, isn't it? When a sudden death occurs, your surrounding community gets published widely, and you have people calling that they want their school screened and this sort of thing. It's so common that a tragedy occurs, and that's an impetus to start a screening program. And I think there have been a number of programs that I've been involved in that have done that and realized that screening is not quite as easy as they thought. And it actually takes quite a deal of a learning curve to get good at. So again, I think history and physical screening is great, and that should be done everywhere. The addition of an ECG is probably only considered in places where the resources and the manpower is available to do it right. So in looking at your study and the people you're following, what do you see in the future? The concept of what an athlete is in clinical practice is changing. For many years, I think the term athlete is synonymous with young, healthy, competitive people. And as the baby boomer generation is now aging into their 50s and 60s, we're seeing lots and lots of master's athletes that are pushing themselves very hard. And they're doing so for good reasons, but it doesn't confer immunity to cardiovascular disease. So we're seeing lots of athletes with coronary disease, with arrhythmias. And with respect to our discussion topic today, early repolarization, what I wonder and where I think we need to study more is whether or not early repol stacked on top of garden variety coronary disease is a potent combination. That's the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. And I think we'll learn over time as we see more aging athletes whether or not that signal holds true. Do you know other databases that are common that will allow you to examine some of these things? I know that there are other databases that have been started. I think most of them are still in their infancy, so to really use them to examine long-term outcomes, with the exception of the Italian database, which has obviously been widely publicized, I don't know of any that are going to allow us to answer these questions immediately. Well, Dr. Baggers, thank you very much for sharing this insight with the audience. I'm sure we're all interested and will look at our athletes a little more carefully in the future. Pleasure was all mine. Thank you for the interview.